Charlotte Blake Austin has a strong presence on stage and off. She carries those roots with us and gives us an image of how we can do the same. Let's welcome Charlotte Blake Austin. Thank you. There's a lot uh, that can be said as you hear, so I'm gonna have you look at me at like five minutes. <laughs> I know we, each of us have 10 and we have someone coming after me. So, um, uh, so many things are well, popping in my head, so some of this may end up being coming off the cuff. Um, I want to uh, see if I can condense what I was going to say, and, and then you can you know, talk to us later. The uh, first was that Connie asked us to do some shout outs to mentors. So uh, I do want to do that. I want to start with my father, who nurtured, uh, who planted the seeds for really what I'm doing. There was no disappearance of storytelling in my community. Um, we were always hearing, reading the works of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, James Weldon Johnson, the creation, those kinds of stories. Um, my father handed me the complete works of Paul Lawrence Dunbar when I was six and selected a poem for me to memorize. Um, we, we, he put me on what we call the church banquet and tea circuit. And I started to read, you were doing, we will now have a reading by Miss Charlotte Blake. So I began standing in front of people at six years old, reciting Paul Lawrence Dunbar, James Weldon Johnson, the black church served as an arena for the display of the talent that was in our community, the stories that were part of our community, the, the music that was part of our community, all of that was thriving. It just wasn't seen by the larger culture. So while we were being maligned by the dominant culture, we were still speaking, manifesting the riches of our culture within. It just wasn't seen from the outside. It never disappeared. We weren't having a revival. We were having a continuation. So the first kudo goes out to my father, to John Blake Jr. Um, I had heard of, you know, the storytelling festival in Tennessee, but the first festival conference that I got wind of, I got a phone call from a friend of mine I was involved with in theater who said, there's a storytelling conference festival coming. I'm like, storytelling? People get together and talk about storytelling. And it was abs. It was the Association of Black Storytellers. They weren't even NABs at that point. And it was 1984, it was the second conference, and it was being held in Philadelphia. I was still teaching, I was a classroom teacher for uh, 21 years. So, so we went to this, and there was this, you know, mysterious spirit, you know, all in blue with butterflies all over his cheeks, and he was moving to the, you know, like, whoa! You know, there was Mary Carter Smith uh, speaking her personal stories, there was Linda, there were all these people, and Linda Linda was in Philadelphia, was also a fifth grade teacher at an independent school and was doing storytelling. So Linda was one of the first people that I met who was doing storytelling in Philadelphia. And what I came to learn was that Mary Carter Smith, Linda Goss, had been invited to Jonesboro. Thank you, Beth, by the way, for all of that revolutionary stuff you did that got us there. Um, and, and they saw Jackie, but then they looked at each other and said, there's more than just you, me, and Jackie who tells story. <laughs> So we need to start our own festival and our own conference. And bam, I mean, black storytellers came from everywhere who were already doing the work. And it was just the first time I realized you get paid for it. So I'm trying to calculate what my father owed me from the time I was six years old, going out with all this stuff. My money, I want my money. <laughs> so I'd like to give that shout out uh, um, to uh, Linda, to Mary Carter Smith, to Jackie, who put African-American folk tales from the South on the map, gave it credibility, gave it richness, gave it energy, so that everybody could enjoy all of these tales, take them unto themselves. The first sort of big festival I did was the two weeks before Jonesboro. That was when it was at the time. It was uh, Hoosier. Ellen Munns, I have no idea how this woman heard of me because I was still a classroom teacher. I had just left teaching maybe a few years before. But I was shaking in my boots. And it's like, these were like the pantheon of the gods and goddesses of storytelling. And I kept getting up and giving these sort of qualifying introductions to, you know, oh, here I am. My... And Milby Birch tipped over to me at one point, whispered in my ear, you don't have to apologize for being here. You're here because you're supposed to be. Just tell your stories. 
So my shout out to uh, Milby Birch also. And then I found out it was really years after I went to Jonesboro. It was 94, my very first experience. I'd never been there before. And here I was as a feature teller. So it was almost sensory overload. There was so much going on. And it wasn't until years later that I found out it was Ed Stivender who had recommended me. And uh, we were at doing some local storytelling, and I, and I thanked him. This is after, you know, a few years after that. And he said in his very Ed way, well, kiddo, I love to see cream rise to the top. So, but at that time, it was, um, uh, that was when you did the sub-themes. So that year, it was Codes of the West. Yeah, so uh, it was cowboys all over. Waddy Mitchell doing cowboy poetry. There was yodelers. There was Kevin Locke doing hoop dancing, and uh, Ray Hicks and Jackie, and there was people from all traditions. It was unbelievable. And the first thing I thought was, this is really beyond a storytelling festival. This is a celebration of our humanity and our commonalities as human beings. And I was talking to Ray and Rosa, you know, Rosa brought her little stuff to sell. And, and uh, at one point, Ray said, you know, there's more spirit here in this here festival than you find in the church organization. So I thought, Coming from a, a background of teaching in a Quaker environment, the Religious Society of Friends, who believe that their institutions represent microcosms of the ideal society where all are equal. Once I got into that environment, I understood that because of the influence of the culture, even Quakers had internalized a perception of who we were. And there were many people in that school who looked like me who actually were marginalized, even though they thought that they were equal partners in that environment, something that I stood up and began to address. When I came into this community, I thought this is also an environment that could be a microcosm of the ideal society, where I'm not a marginalized person or a person of color. I could just be a person. I could speak my, all of my stories, the history of my people as well, without someone being offended that I'm not giving them something, a story that they can just laugh and be tickled about. We learned all of the stories of our history, and this is something that all of us need to know. We are all equal in the sight of the IRS. <laughs> so if I'm not like a full citizen, can I have my tax money back, please? So all of these people, all of these traditions, the First Nations people, uh, Robert and Nancy, people who represent those Asian traditions, people who came here and worked and labored and, and built the country, all of those stories are part of the patchwork quilt that is American culture. So I'm looking forward to that time when I can look out in this audience, look around you folks, <clears throat> and see that patchwork quilt represented. So there, so our um, last storyteller, I'm going to come up for just a moment after him, but Willie Claflin, who had this idea, he's been this driving force with Karen and all the NAPS board for framing this whole weekend as a time to really move forward, but to be looking back, to be honoring our mentors. Willie has a great heart. He's funny, he's a thoughtful man, and he's really a brilliant storyteller. He always takes us to different edges. Willie Claflin. Well, I've been very fortunate to see a festival that has that patchwork quilt of an audience, a complete representation of all the cultural streams that have flowed into this country. And to tell you about it, uh, because of my connection with the Intergalactic Storytelling Festival, <laughs> in Roswell, New Mexico, I am able to travel through time, and I am reporting back to you, I'm actually a hologram, I'm reporting back to you <laughs> from the year 2032. Before I tell you about the American Storytelling Festival, which is in its 18th year here in 2032, I want to just very briefly introduce for 30 seconds Glar Clerkson, who is the torchbearer of the yellow plastic smiley faced people from the Andromeda Nebula, to speak a few inspirational words. Would you please welcome him? Think about that for a moment. 
doesn't that really speak what's on all of our hearts? So a quick look back, I know probably you've been too busy to follow the events of the following 20 years in any great detail. It's hard enough to think about the past, let alone really explore the future events. That's okay, no blame. A uh, couple of events here from the perspective of 2032. As you know, in 2014, the International Storytelling Center bought back that huge building, which had been the plan all along in going bankrupt, and they bought it back for about one quarter of the value at which, well, I'm, I'm absolutely serious, this will happen, I predict, in 2014. Now the center was back there again. Now that, that big building was back in the middle of Jonesboro, and that's why the Occupy Jonesboro movement in 2015 occurred. <laughs> Chaotic, no leaders, what did they want anyway? Anyway, hundreds of people came from all over the country and just pitched tents all over Jonesboro and started telling stories for free. Which was the same thing that happened to feature tellers that year. They had to tell for free. But it was <clears throat> it was a unifying thing. Well, and it was the occupation of the second floor of the International Storytelling Center that brought down NSN at that point because um, those two or three huge upstairs rooms, uh, they were occupied by about 130 storytelling protesters who did something there that was completely unexpected, unprecedented, and rather inappropriate. They told stories there. <laughs> they used those vast spaces with cathedral, they put human beings in them, and then they told stories there. It was too much. They're all thrown in jail. <clears throat> Minor misdemeanor sent on home. Anyway, what I want to tell you just very briefly about is the American Storytelling Festival here in 2032, now in its 18th year. As you remember, it had its genesis in 2012 at the NSN conference um, because by pure luck, uh, Willie Claflin, uh, in a moment of madness, decided to reserve the domain name American Storytelling Festival, .net, .org, and .com in case someone interfered. <laughs> and... In a further act of lunacy, the afternoon after he spoke from 2032 to the audience of 2012, he went on the phone with his lawyer to trademark the name American Storytelling Festival. That was the beginning of the festival. How did the festival get to be the way it is? Why is there a total patchwork quilt here in 2032? It's because of the input of all of you people here today. Thank you so much. So, I want to ask just one more thing. We um, have some beautiful flames, yellow, red, and orange paper, that we want you to write some words of wisdom, advice to other tellers, advice you wish you had heard advice you have heard from your fire keepers, and words of wisdom to um, listeners. You're going to receive this. Uh, I think they're going down the rows now. And we're going to end here in just the next few moments. But during the weekend, today if possible, I'd like for you to put those words of wisdom all the way along that blue timeline back there. So all weekend long, we can learn and do just from what Willie said from 2032. We can really mine the wisdom that's in this room. This event, this morning, this time together has been brilliant. Thank you all. <laughs>